Okay. So uh, even though this is right before a break and uh, attendance is way down, we'll, we'll still go a, a, a full topic here because this is basically going to wrap up uh, the main course, uh, the main topics of the course. We'll talk about what, what's going to happen after we come back from break, uh, but uh, at the end. Uh, but uh, searching and sorting is the last major topic that is covered on your hacks uh, and your uh, your uh, assignments, and of course your your final exam. Uh, the the last two to uh, topics that we'll be talking about when we come back uh, will be uh, graphical user interfaces and uh, databases. Uh, but those will only be on two labs, uh, and they kind of uh, pigeon or they they kind of uh, dovetail into the next course. Uh, which is why we don't uh, cover them too deeply here. Uh, so again, to, to, to uh, uh, wrap up searching and sorting, I wanted to talk about a few miscellaneous uh, odds and ends, uh, and then summarize everything with a demonstration that we're going to work with together here. Uh, first of all, a discussion on natural versus uh, artificial ordering. Now, if I, what, what is a natural ordering? We have an intuitive notion of, of naturally ordered elements. Uh, for example, integers. If I gave you a collection of integers, uh, you know, five, seven, uh, three, two, and one, uh, uh, what order would you put them in? You'd, you'd put the smallest first and then the largest next, right? So you'd put them in ascending order. That's kind of the natural ordering. Right, a natural ordering is basically ascending order. Not, uh, not it, it is, it is natural to sort uh, numbers in ascending order. Right? Uh, it is natural. Now, uh, and I'm going to put this one into quotes here because what may, may seem natural to us uh, as uh, English speakers or uh, uh, other uh, uh, speakers of other languages uh, would mean alphabetic ordering. Uh, but as we've already seen, alphabetic ordering is not natural as far as, uh, as programming goes, right? Uh, what is the natural order with respect to strings? If you were to, if you were to take uh, the strings and you naturally order them, then what, we, what am I talking about there? Lexiographic ordering. In other words, going to the ASCII text table and looking up their numerical values. Now, natural to us would be like dictionary ordering, where capital A apple and lowercase a apple appear right next to each other. But in lexiographic ordering, that doesn't happen. Apple is way up here with the capitals, and then we've got capital Z zoo, and then we've got uh, lowercase a apple. So when I say natural, I mean natural as far as a programming language is concerned. So it's natural to sort strings in lexicographic, that is the ASCII text table, table order, right? What about other things that are natural? Uh, for example, uh, what is natural about, say, freshmen, uh, sophomores, 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 uh, and uh, juniors, and seniors? What order would you put those in? Well, I naturally ordered them already, right? I, in fact, I'd have to rack my brain to not put that into natural ordering. Uh, sophomores come before, or uh, sophomores come before juniors. Freshmen come before sophomores because this is the natural progression of something that uh, that you would uh, that you would do. You know, uh, you become freshman and then you put in so many credit hours and you become a sophomore, etc. But is that the natural ordering with respect to, to lexicographic? No. What would come first? Freshman. Okay, that works. What would come second, though? Oh, <laughs> uh, careful. Juniors, why? Because it starts with a J, right? And then seniors, and then sophomores. So it would be a completely out of order here. I'm going to show you a quick demonstration here. For, uh, I, I, I pulled this from another class. Uh, it's just a, a web page demonstration of basically the same idea. Uh, let me go ahead and sort by year. Right? Now, if this were natural ordering with respect to lexicographic ordering, you would again expect uh, freshmen uh, and then uh, juniors, then seniors, then sophomores. But let's go ahead and try it. Now, I'm looking at this roster. All the freshmen are first, then the sophomores, then the juniors, and then the seniors. So with respect to our, our notion of a natural ordering, or this is actually called an artificial ordering. 
because it's natural, uh, as far as the programming language is concerned, to order them with, uh, with freshmen, then juniors, then seniors, then sophomores. So what we want is an artificial ordering. Um, this is, or sorry, let me, this is actually an artificial ordering, right? But it's natural to us as, 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 as humans because this is, of course, the designations that we give in order. Uh, but it's unnatural to a computer because a computer, a computer would want to sort these lexicographically. Right? So how do we impose an artificial ordering on a, 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 to change a natural ordering? How could we do this? We can't use the strings, right? Because if you use strings, uh, all caps, lowercase, whatever you're going to do, uh, the, uh, the F comes first and then the J comes second. So what we, can we do instead? A computer, oh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, OK, what kind of a type def? A numerated type, right? So with respect to C, in C, you could define A. Uh, an enumerated type. And let's just go ahead and remind ourselves here, a quick uh, review. How do you uh, declare a, an enumerated type? Well, type def, you are declaring a type definition. And enum, because it's a new, an enumerated type. Uh, and then you could call it year, right? Uh, and then what order would you put these in? You would put them in freshman, freshman, then sophomore. Remember, uh, it is uh, a comma delimited list then a junior, then a senior. Right? Now, the, oh, the order that these would receive, the actual values in C that these would receive are 0, 1, 2, and 3. And now we can use that same natural ordering of numbers. Right? Uh, now, uh, our natural ordering, na natural ordering uh, that is with respect to numbers, works. Right? The drawback to this, of course, is what? If I tr tried to print, uh, say I create a, uh, what did I have over here? Uh, let's say uh, Javi Baez, he's a freshman. And so uh, if I tried to print that out, what, what value would it print out instead of freshman any now? It would end up printing out zero. So in order to get a, uh, an artificial ordering, that means that you're going to have to add some more bells and whistles to convert those, uh, those enumerated types to actual string values. That's not that big of a deal. What else could you do here? You could create an array of strings. Char star, uh, let's say, year to string right? is equal to freshman, sophomore. Uh, and you know what? I already wrote it, so let me go ahead and just copy paste it. There we go. Now, what can you tell me about the index 0 element? If I've got a, an enumerated type freshman, and I put that in as an index, what am I going to get back? What do you get when you use, uh, say, year two string of freshman? What do you get there? Uh, let me go ahead and print it out, print f, uh, percent s, uh, there's a hint. What type is it going to be? It's going to be a uh, string. It's going to print freshman. Right? So you could you actually use the same trick even without an enumerated type. If you just define this, the, the, the thing at the 0 index is freshman. The thing at the 1 index is sophomore. Uh, juniors is going to be 3. And then senior is, uh, is uh, sorry, senior is 3. And then uh, junior is 4. Right? So there are lots of ways that you can handle this. And, uh, and uh, if, if you don't handle it like this, then you're going to get some unnatural ordering. That if you sorted by year, then you would get freshman, junior, senior, and sophomore, which is not what you want. Okay? So sometimes you have to deal with that. Uh, another thing is sorting stability. So if two elements, say A, uh, A or let's say uh, element uh, E sub A and E sub B appear in the original uh, it, it, uh, appear in the original um, array, let's say, uh, and are uh, are equal. That is, e sub a is equal to e sub b. Right? 
this, yeah, so this is working, good. Uh, and they are never put out of the original order, then they are said to be, then the uh, sorting algorithm is said to be stable. All right. Just as a really quick example here, think about selection sort. Here, I, I start here and I try to, uh, I try to find the minimum element. Uh, say, say I've got two tens. Right? Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and switch over here to the overhead projector. Uh, there we go. Say that I've got two tens. I'll label them. So 5, 10, A, and 7, and 10, B. Let's go ahead and simulate a really quick uh, uh, version of, of selection sort here. So I go through and I find the minimum, which is five. So I end up not swap. I end up swapping it with itself. I go through here and find the minimum, which is seven, and so seven goes here, right? Swapping it with ten a, and I go through and I find oh ten. Okay, that's the minimum. Swap it with itself. Swap it with itself. The original relative ordering of ten and ten here, they're not put out, ever put out of order. Right? They're, uh, without my labels here, they're indistinguishable. 10 is equal to 10, and there's no other, no, nothing else to say that this 10 is preferred over this 10 or whatever. Right? But I am labeling them to show you that they never, were never put out of order. Now let's take the exact same thing with quicksort. Um, A, 7, and 10, B. With the way that I presented it. Okay? So this is our pivot element. We put everything that's larger to it over to the right, 10, A. We put everything that's uh, less than a, uh, over to the uh, over to the left. Well, seven is not less, so it goes over here. Ten, and maybe I should have just done two over here. Uh, Ten is uh, okay. Well, that's greater than five, so I'll put it over here. Ten B, and there, there's my pivot element, and then I recurse and sort that uh, that section of the list. But what happened to the two things that were equal? They they were they ended up going out of order. Right? Now, they might go back into order temporarily, but if they ever go out of order even once, it's called unstable. So, you, there are some, uh, so we, as we've seen, selection sort is a stable sorting algorithm the way that we presented it. Quick sort is an unstable uh, algorithm the way that we presented it. The, usually, you can make a, take a stable, uh, an unstable sorting algorithm and put it, uh, make it stable again. So, why, why is this important? Uh, let me go back to, there it is, DGA. Right? Let me go back to this example over here. Uh, there we go. And let's go ahead and uh, let's refresh it first of all. Make sure that we've got uh, clean data. Uh, let me go ahead and sort it by year. Right there. Now we've got freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. If I went and sorted it by GPA descending, what is your prediction? What do you want to have happen? Or you know what? Uh, let, let, let me go ahead and start over. Uh, all right, let's first sort it by GPA, descending. There we go. All right, so now we've got high GPAs at the top, low GPAs at the bottom. All right. OK. What, ha what, what would you expect if I now sort it by year? You would expect freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and then seniors, right? But look at one of those sections. Let's take the freshmen up there. What order would you expect them to be in? What order would you want them in? I first sorted them by GPA in descending order. Then if I go and sort them, uh, and I break, uh, then, I, then I go and sort them by uh, year, all the freshmen will be here, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. So uh, focusing on the freshmen there, what order would their GPA be in? W would you expect it to be in? In descending order, right? Because that would be a stable sorting algorithm. If two things had uh, the same GPA, like, uh, looks like I've got two Rick, uh, Rick Rentries there, or whatever, uh, then I would, I would expect them to, 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 stay, to stay in that relative ordering to begin with. Uh, that, uh, let's let's look, at, look at two freshmen here. Brett Jackson and, who's another one? Uh, Ryan Sandberg here. He's got 3.5 and uh, Brett Jackson has 3.8. I would expect Brett Jackson to be up here as a freshman. And then I would expect Ryan Sandberg to be down here as a freshman because I first ordered them by GPA. Let's see if that happens. Are the freshmen all sorted according to their GPA? No. So what kind of sorting algorithm do you think is working here? An unstable sorting algorithm, right? Uh, so uh, th 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 these, things uh, these things have real world implications, both uh, natural versus non-natural ordering, and uh, stable sorting algorithms, right? 
you'd expect things to be stable mostly because if I want to first sort by this category, then by this category, a subcategory, uh, well, then I would sort by this, and then I would sort by this so that I could, uh, I could look at all the freshmen and look at all their GPAs, then look at all the juniors, look at all their GPAs. As it is, with this unstable sorting algorithm, I can't do that. I'd have to take this over into Excel and then do some manual work. There is an unstable sorting algorithm at work here. And just to show you that, again, it, it, it has real world implications, think about going, th uh, you might not have too many uh, uh, course records yet, uh, but if you go into your MyRed system and you sort, your, uh, 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 sort, uh, sort, uh, sort all of your grades by semester, what, do you, what, what, you, what would you expect to, uh, to come up in the future, say three years from now? You'd expect fall 2008, then spring 2019, then fall 2019, right? then spring 2020, then fall 2020. What are you, what are you actually going to get? What do you think? Spring, fall, spring, fall, spring, fall. Are you going to get that? You're going to get all the falls up here, then the years, then all the springs down here, then all the years in order. Right? That's because they don't use a proper artificial ordering. Uh, they, they're, they're, uh, the, if you look at the interface for, uh, for MyRed, it uses a natural ordering, in other words, an alexiographic ordering. They don't use a trick like I just described here. Right? And if you, uh, if you ever have roster data, you, you probably can't see mo uh, uh, any grades other than your own, but this is basically inspired by uh, roster data that we can pull through MyRed. And it does exactly the same thing here. It's both non-artificial, it's natural ordering, and it's unstable. So it's a, it, it's a pain in the butt to work with. Right? In general, you should prefer stable sorting algorithms. Right? Uh, in general, you should prefer stable sorting algorithms. And if an algorithm is unstable, it can usually be made stable with a little bit of extra work. Right? Uh, and it might be more work th uh, with certain algorithms than others, but you generally want a stable sorting algorithm. Okay? And those are the implications. Uh, that if you don't do something like this, then you get weird uh, ways of doing data. In fact, if I sort it the exact same way over and over and over again, what is it doing? It's changing it. It's extremely unstable. Uh, if, if, if I sort one, once and then sort again, you should expect no change because it's already in order. But of course, it's, 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 it's doing whatever it's doing, right? Uh, this is actually the built-in sorting algorithm in JavaScript, which is terrible. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why, right? Uh, but that's the idea behind st uh, uh, stable sorting algorithms and when you would want to do uh, uh, natural or artificial orderings, okay? All right, one other thing that I wanted to look at today was a demonstration on how to sort an array of strings. For that, I'm going to go over to REPL here initially. Uh, I've got an array of strings here, Chris, Margaret, Alan, Grace, uh, and Zeppo. Right? So I've, I've got five names here, and I want to sort them. I'll go ahead and try using quicksort. Right? Quicksort, pass in the array, the number of elements in the array, five. Uh, the size of each element, which is going to be a char star, that's what a string is. This is an array of strings, so technically it's a char star star, but the, the way that you can declare and initialize that is by using the square brackets here. I'm going to try using strcmp, and let's see what happens here. First of all, it's going to complain about it, uh, but it, did it do anything? Chris, Margaret, Alan, Grace, Zeppo. Are they sorted? No, if it was sorted, then Alan should come first, right? But it's not sorted, and the reason is it's because it's complaining about this thing over here. So let me go ahead and look. go to the RTM, uh, read the manual. Let's go to the man pages for quick sort. There we go. So what is the comparator? What is a comparator again? A comparator is a function that returns an integer and takes two const void stars. What does strcmp take? Does it take two const void stars? No. So what are we going to have to do? We're going to have to do something else. We can't use strcmp because strcmp is not a comparator function. We have to use something else. Okay. So uh, I'll just note that down. Uh, you cannot use uh, strcmp as it is not technically a 
uh, comparator, right? It takes const void chars instead of const, uh, or const char stars instead of const void stars. So let's go ahead and, and write our own comparator here. Uh, for lack of imagination, I'll go ahead and call mine strcmp. Is that a good idea, for, first of all, to call it strcmp all lowercase? Const void star, const void star. Probably not, because it's our uh, return. L let me go ahead and see if it even complains about it. Hopefully it does. Uh, const void star, oh, A, and sorry, B. There we go. Um, oh. Now, now can we uh, pass in strcmp? There we go. Uh, and certainly not because conflicting types. Uh, strcmp is defined in the string library. You can't redefine it here. Right? I could get rid of the string library, and then I've got my own string <laughs> comparator. I'm not going to do that because I actually want to use it. I don't want to go through and do a lexicographic comparison myself. Uh, but I could call it str big cmp right? because function names are uh, case sensitive. So this is actually a different name. That's still not a great idea because uh, you, might, you, you might miss it. Uh, maybe, look, what, we're no longer paying by the uh, character here. We can actually go string comparison or CMP string, right? Like we uh, to like uh, stay with the uh, same uh, uh, patterns that we were doing before, like CMP student by name, et cetera, et cetera. So let's go ahead and, and use CMP string. Uh, let me go ahead and pass that in now instead of strcmp, and it'll at least uh, compile now. But what should this look like? Now, if I followed the original pattern that I gave you, we would do something like this. Const char star x is equal to const char star a. And do it for y and b. right? I've got now two const char stars. And I can go ahead and now I can use strcmp on x and y. All right? Let's see if this works. Chris, Margaret, Alan, Grace, Seppo. At least it's no longer complaining. Right? And at least it still runs, but is it working? No. To understand that, again, I'm going to go back to my dot cam here. Here is my array of strings. Names is char star star, or, char, or star star char, whichever you want to look at it. Uh, I should have written it like this, char star star because it's a two-dimensional array of characters. But each one, like Margaret and Grace here, let's, take, just, let's just say that we were going to compare these two. Each one of these is a char star. So how do these get passed to my, uh, my, my string comparison function? What happens is it doesn't pass this. If it passed this, would it be able to swap those? No. Remember the, it, remember, remember the swapping of integers? If I give you two integers uh, in the swap function, can you swap them? Well, yeah, you can swap the, uh, the parameter values, but can you swap the two original? No. So what do I have to do with those x and y's to pass them off to a swap function so that they can actually get swapped? I have to pass them by reference. These references have to be passed by reference. So what ha ends up happening is uh, th that these get passed in with an ampersand in front of them. Right? Meaning that when I get this thing, this is actually a char star star. It is a pointer to this pointer. This pointer is a pointer to Margaret. This is a char star star. It is a pointer to this pointer, which is a pointer to Grace. Th that's what I actually receive. So what do I need to do? I need to cast them as char star stars. Let's go ahead and do that. Uh, go back to the desktop, VGA, here we go. So I won't, I'll have char star star. There we go. And ch star star and star star. Now let's run it again. I'm gonna, uh, let's see what happens here. All right. Now it still complains and it still doesn't do anything. Why? What is it complaining about now? X and Y are char star stars. What does strcmp require? Char stars. So how do I take my char star star, two stars over here, right? And how do I make it into a regular old char star? How do I get rid of one of these stars? You dereference it. I'll dereference X and I'll dereference Y. Oops, dereference Y. 
And now when I run it, no complaints and it works, right? You could have done this in one shot. Typically what you do is const, uh, say a const char star is e uh, x is equal to const char star star of a. And then you go ahead and dereference that right away. Dereference that uh, and put a balance your parentheses there. And it would look something like that instead. And then I wouldn't need to dereference it down here and do the same thing for y. Uh, const char star star y dereference of b. And then you don't have to dereference it like that. You can just use x and y. Or you can take and, and, and take the, the casting and the dereferencing and then just put it in line in uh, strcmp. And that's the way to, oops, I screwed up somewhere. Uh, semicolon, thank you. And go down, there we go. There, Alan, Chris, Grace, Margaret, and Zeppo. All right. So you gotta be careful. You can't use strcmp because it's not a comparator. But you also have to realize that when, when qsort asks a comparator, tell me, are these things in order, or are they out of order, or are they equal? Because I want to swap them. What's going to have to happen is I'm going to have to pass off pointers to those things. So I'm not going to pass the things. I'm going to pass pointers to the thing. And so now you've got pointers, which are pointers to arrays of, of characters, which are strings. And you need to cast them correctly as pointers to pointers. And then you dereference them because you actually want those strings. And that's the picture that I was trying to draw. I've never found, uh, I've never, I, I, I've been, I, I tried uh, several iterations of coming up with a diagram that, that shows this complex logic, and I failed every single time. But that's the closest I've come there. So it's a complex idea, and, uh, it, and, uh, and, and it's necessary to understand if you're going to sort arrays of strings. Okay. The last thing I want to do is, oh, here, let me go ahead and cut and paste this as the solution so that you have it in your notes. Uh, so solution, uh, cast them as pointers to pointers to chars, and that then dereference. Right? And I'll, I'll make sure that you have that, uh, that code snippet there in your notes, okay? when I post it later tonight. Uh, the, another miscellaneous item that you're going to have to deal with I eventually is null values. How can you handle null values? Well. Unfortunately, if, you, uh, if, you, if you're doing something like we did before and uh, you're trying to pass off, an, uh, if you've got an array of null uh, and there's a null in there somewhere, if you've got an array of pointers and there's a null in there, uh, where do you put that? Right? If you've got uh, students, say, uh, say that those names represent, uh, are, are, are um, full-on uh, structures instead of actual strings. So we've got a student that represents me, a student re that represents Margaret Hamilton, a student that represents Alan Turing, et cetera, et cetera. What, do we, uh, what if we've got a null student, a null value in there somewhere? How do we handle those? If I were to sort them, should I put nulls first or should I put nulls last? Or just randomly <laughs> peppered throughout? Randomly? Anybody want to vote for that one? Probably not, uh, <laughs> unless, you're, unless you're, uh, you, you favor chaos, right? So uh, where do you want them, first or last? La OK, last. If I want to put them last, so often you need a um, uh, complex logic to order null values. Oops, null values. Not just checking for null, but checking for relative null. Uh, for example, say that I've got a and b. Uh, here's a int cmp const char or const void star a const void star b. It might look something like the following. Uh, it, of course, you would want to take care of the null values first because you don't want to dereference them to get the first name or the last name of the student if that's representing a student or something like that. So uh, you, you would check for null. If A is equal to null and B is equal to null, well, then they're, they're the same thing. What should I return? If, I, if two things are equal, what does a comparator return? Zero, right? Uh, else if A is null and B is not null, and you said that you wanted to put nulls last, so which one would come first in this case? If B is not null, that would come before A, which is null if you want to put nulls at the bottom. So what would I return here? Something negative or something positive? They are out of order, so I would put return 
something positive. There we go. Else if, and it's still going to be an if here, if A is not equal to null and B is, is equal to null, then I will return something, uh, if they're in order, I'll return something negative. Else, what do you know at this point in this else condition here? Neither A nor B is null, so fall back to your regular logic. Right? So if you want to handle null values and you want to, uh, to order them in a certain way, put, them, put all the nulls first and then uh, the rest of them last or something like that, then you would need to logic something like this. Now, I don't know what I'm sorting. I, 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 did, I wanted to keep it abstract. I didn't, but there is a, uh, in the, uh, in the uh, textbook, there is an example with the, the, the student example, uh, the student structure, if you want to check it out. Right? So null values may need to be handled. If you don't handle null values, what happens? You pass it off to, a compar uh, to the comparator, it's null, and you try to dereference it to get the first name. What happens when you dereference a null pointer? Well, remember what Bret Hart said? You can't dereference a null pointer, and then you get a smack over the back of your head. Right? Ho hopefully everybody remembers that video. Right? It's a great way to remember that. Right? It's a good video, yeah. <laughs> All right, so. Make sure that you're handling null values, or maybe you, have, maybe you don't want to handle null values, and having a null value is actually bad data. Well, you might want to validate your data then to make sure that you don't have a null value in there somewhere. Okay. All right. The last thing I want to do as far as uh, this topic goes is to show you a demonstration by actually solving a problem. All right. And this is going to be very similar to something that you, stuff that you're going to do for uh, your last hack and your last assignment here. In fact, you're going to be using the same data set. I've got some data here. Uh, I'll, I'll just look at the top of the data here, data.csv. Uh, that's too big. There we go. Ah, still too big. Not wide enough. OK, well, big enough. Uh, these are uh, the, the, this is artifact. This is not real data. Uh, it, w it was generated from real data. Uh, so I looked at a lot of data sets to try to uh, for your final your final assignment. It's basically a data processing project, uh, and I looked at a lot of data sets. I, uh, I wanted to do something with the NHL because uh, at the time I, I was thinking NHL. Uh, and baseball season wasn't over, uh, so that I didn't have complete data yet. Uh, but uh, I, I, was try I, I was trying to think of some way to, uh, that you can process large data sets. And I happened upon this data set right here. This is not the original data set. I massaged it a little to get it into the form that I wanted. Uh, but the original data set w uh, was trying to solve a problem of, uh, uh, of, of, of having data to detect fraudulent transactions. So for example, one, one, one way that a transaction could be fraudulent is if you've got, say, a deposit. Where Do I have a pay? Or a, yeah, there's a deposit. Uh, there's a deposit, and th uh, there's the amount of the deposit. There's a, this one is the original balance before the transaction, and then this is the uh, balance after the transaction, or something like that. And I think that 56,000 plus 249,000 is equal to 305,000. One, way of, one easy way to detect fraud would be, did somebody go in and change the balance after the transaction? Right? They took a few dollars out of there, or they added a few dollars uh, in there. Right? That, the, the, that would, that would uh, indicate something really fishy. Uh, there are other ways that you can uh, you know, uh, detect fraudulent transactions. For example, uh, a, a, very, uh, a very steady, very regular de uh, uh, deposits of uh, amounts just under ten thousand dollars or something like that will fail. Uh, you're, you're right under the threshold for having to, uh, for the bank to have to report it to the IRS, and basically you're you're probably doing money laundering or something like that. And so there are lots of ways that you can uh, detect stuff like that through transactions. The original data set was actually an artificial data set because, of course, you can understand that banks are not are pretty reluctant to give out their real data to researchers. Uh, this, is, this is a guy, a researcher in finance. And so what he did is he had a very small set of real data. From that, he was able to, uh, to produce a model. This is his PhD thesis. He was able to produce a model by which he could generate large amounts of data that basically had the same distribution as the original data. And so in, in this, I've got, let's, let's see, uh, we're, how many lines are in this data? Uh, oops. 
password count line data.csv. There we go. It was just a uh, slow one point. I got it down to 1.7 million records, OK? Which is not huge, but it is big enough that you start to have to think about different ways of doing things. Uh, because what I want to do is I want, I want to solve a problem that you're not going to be solving on your, uh, uh, on your assignment. What I want to do is I want to detect uh, duplicates. I want to detect bad data. You'll note right here that uh, at, the, at the front, every, every transaction has a unique identifier. This is actually what's called a UUID. It's a universally unique identifier. Uh, and I think we've talked about this before, but uh, it basically it's a very long num random number that is generated by this hash, uh, ha this, uh, hash function uh, that uses the time and a couple of other things uh, so that it has the property that no two uni UUIDs uh, have, a, 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 with very, very low probability, will you ever generate the same two UUIDs. So I'm pretty sure that I have no duplicates in here because I generated a, a brand new UUID for each and every single one of these. But just to be sure, I want to go through here and I want to make sure that every UUID in here is unique. And if, I do, and if it's not unique, I want to be able to detect that and say something screwed up and take out that record or something because we don't want duplicate records. So ideas. Let's sketch out an idea here on the doc cam. What's one, what, what's one way of, of go, uh, the, suppose that I've got a, 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 an array of called transactions, right? And there are 1.7 million, and this is just pseudocode here, records, right? So you've got this, and then you've got, uh, you know, dot IDs. Say that they're structures, dot ID. How would you go about searching for duplicates? Yeah. Okay. Why? What if I sort it by IDs? Where are the duplicates, duplicates going to be? Right next to each other, right? It's not going to be one, two, three is up here and then one, two, three is down here if I sorted it by that ID. One, two, three and one, two, three are going to be right here next to each other, right? So that's one idea. I could sort, uh, sort it, then dot, dot, dot. You would go through one by one and check the guy next to it. So for i running from 0 up to 1.7 million minus 1, right? If transaction of i dot id is equal to transaction of i plus one right next to its neighbor, so we'll probably minus two, dot id. Then output dupe, duplicate found, all right? That's a pretty good idea, all right? Another, uh, another way that you could have done this is the naive way of doing this would have been start at the top the first one, compare it to all the other ones and if it, uh, and, and it, without sorting. Now you don't have to sort. Start at the first one, compare it to all the other ones. If you find a duplicate, fine, output it. Go to the second one, compare it to all the other ones. If you find a duplicate, output it. Right? Something like that would look like the following. Right? So for i running from 0, and I'll just call it n now, n minus 1. Right? Uh, for j running from, we don't have, if I check a versus b, I don't have to check also B versus A, right? Because I've already, I took care of that when I started out with A. I, I, I compared A to B down here. When I get down to B down here, I don't need to compare it back up to A. So I can start J at I plus 1. Right? At the ith element, compare it to all the elements after it, up to N minus 1, or, or whatever. And so this is minus 2. Okay. Then if transaction of i dot id is equal to transaction of j dot id, then output duplicate. Okay. Now, if n is about 1.7 million, how many times is this loop going to execute? Or this entire program here is going to execute? How many times am I going to be doing a, an id check here? 
1.7 minus 2, forget about minus 2, about 1.7 here, 1.7 million here, and about 1.7 million here uh, divided by 2. Right? It's actually going to be 1.7 million times 1.7 million minus 1, all divided by 2. Right? And this is millions here. Okay. So how big is that? Uh, 1.7 million times 1.7 million. Let's just round it up to 2 million. 2 million times 2 million is 4, what? 4 trillion, right? So this is on the order of about uh, 4 trillion. Right. Okay. What about this one? Uh, where, what, this one. This better solution over here. This is what I would characterize. This is what I would characterize as a brute force solution. Try every single pair. Right? This one is a little bit more clever because it realizes that if we sort it, then we only have to go through the list once. There's not two for loops here leading to an an n squared uh, behavior. There's only 1.7 million here rather than four trillion. Okay, but we still have to pay for this investment. What are some? What are two options that we've looked at? What if I sort it by? Selection sort. What if I sort it by quick sort? If I sort it by selection sort, how uh, how many operations do you think there will be? About. Let's keep it. Uh, let's keep it general. So if uh, if I have n, where n is 1.7 million for the full data set, I could change n and maybe only do a thousand of them. Check the first thousand for duplicates instead. Do you remember how big it was? N squared. What about quick sort? It's going to be n log n. And what about this? How many uh, iterations would we go for this for loop here? n. So in either case, it's going to be n operations and n operations. We can kind of ignore that. This is where the big investment is. How, uh, how fast are these going to be? Okay. I'm going to go back over here. And as you can imagine, I went ahead and implemented both of these. Let's go ahead and make everything. Don't worry about that. Uh, duplicates, check, selection sort. Right. So here it is. Uh, I, I load up the transactions from the database. Uh, that, that's necessary. And then I sort it using selection sort. This is not a built-in sorting algorithm because, of course, it is a terrible sorting algorithm. Uh, but nevertheless, it looks a lot like quick sort here but because that's how I designed it. Uh, there are, it doesn't have the size of because I didn't do a generic quick sort like you probably did in lab last week. Uh, but I did a quick sort for these kinds of transactions here. Then what did I do? I went through only once and I looked at the ith element and the i plus one element. And if they were the same with respect to ID, I've got a comparator here for transactions by ID. If they were the same, then I output that I found a duplicate. And I count up the number of duplicates that I find. And then I output and found however many duplicates there were. Okay. Then let's go over to the second program, duplicate uh, quasi -lin quasi linear. Remember, this is going to be quick sort here because it's quasi linear. Uh, the only difference here, it's exactly the same, except for this one line where I actually use quick sort instead of selection sort. In fact, let's do a get diff duplicate uh, selection sort duplicate quasi Linear. Yep, it, that single line is the only difference. Otherwise, the programs are exactly the same. All right. All right, I've made them already. Let's go ahead and run it. Find dupes slow selection sort. I already named it for uh, for what it is. It's slow. I have to give it the data file .csv and how many records you actually want to do. So let's go ahead and start with only ten thousand. Okay. All right. It was noticeable. Right. In fact, let's go ahead and redo that and actually time it. One point. Let's round it up. One point eight seconds for ten thousand records. If I did this again, what would you expect it to be for two, 20, 000? I've doubled the input size here. Instead of ten thousand records, I've got twenty thousand records. Remember selection sort n squared. What happens? To the, uh, to, the, to, uh, to, uh, to the speed, to the re number of resources, when you go from, 2N, uh, from n squared up to 2n squared. What happens to this 2 out here? It becomes a 4. 4 times as big, or 4 times as slow. 
So your prediction would be what? 1.8 seconds times? Four, okay. Which would be four, uh, 7.2 seconds? Ooh, really, really close, almost on the money there. Right? What if I went to 40,000? I double it again. Now seven seconds becomes roughly 28 seconds, right? That's, that's tol tolerable. We can sit here and wait for 28 seconds, right? But what if I went up to, say, 1.7 million? While we're waiting for that, let's figure it out. Right? So if I've got 1.7 million, that's 1.7 million right there, and my baseline was 10,000, then that's going to be 170 times uh, bigger input, right? 170 times bigger input times, so 170, what, ha what happens, I, I go from n squared, uh, I go from, I'll just write it down like this, I go from n squared to, uh, this is an arrow, not a greater than, 170n squared. So what is that going to be? When I take, it's no longer twice as big, it's 170 times as big. So 170 squared, is going to be 28,900 times slower, times slower. So if I take that and multiply it by 1.8 seconds to, I don't know, days? OK, that's not that bad. To hours? There we go. It'll take the better part of 14 and a half hours to complete. All right. And there, it was, it was 28.9 seconds, really on there. So again, if I go up to 1.7, 1, 2, 3, so 1, 1.7 million. Right. It's, okay, it loaded the database, so now it starts working. Should I sit here and wait? I will be waiting for 14 and a half hours for, to, to, for this to get done, right? So no, right? Let's try it now with quicksort. Again, the difference is going to be that one line of code and here's the compiled version of it. Uh, find dupes fast. Again, same data set. And let's start out with 10,000 to be fair. Uh, was there any noticeable delay there at all? Nope. In fact, let's go ahead and time it. Right. 0 0.02 seconds. What was it before? 1.7 seconds or 1.8 seconds? Let's double the input size. What would you expect it to be now? Quasi-linear, so ignore the... Uh, uh, that lower order log term. It's almost linear, so if I double the input size, it should double the running time. So it should be 0 0.04 seconds or thereabouts. What if I double it again? Not 28 seconds, it's going to be 0 0.08 seconds. What if I go all the way up to 1.7 million, which was crazy before, because now it's, uh, before it was you know, going to be 14 and a half hours. The only difference here now is it's 170 times as big, and it didn't take, the baseline wasn't 1.8 seconds, it was 0 0.02 seconds, right? Uh, and I'm not even going to bother to convert that to hours. It should be, uh, mm, well, where is it? Half-life of, come on, pot. Pi, why, why are you giving, so it, it, it's 1.1 times 3.14. It, it, it's trying to be sm uh, clever here, it's trying to be a smart ass uh, for me. So let's go ahead and see that that bears up about three seconds, right? One, two, three, a little bit more. There we go, about six seconds, okay, all right? But not 14 and a half hours, all right? So the difference here is stark. The only difference is one line of code, right? What was, what was my git diff there? The choice of algorithm, a slow selection sort or a quick built-in quick sort implementation, right? This is, the diff this, is, this is only a polynomial difference, right? N squared, uh, that's not that bad. Right? In practice, it is. With even just 1.6 million records, which is not by any standards big data, 1.7 million records is nothing. In fact, I think the original uh, data set that I had, I had to scrub out a bunch of stuff. Uh, the original data set, I think, had um, several, hundred, uh, several hundred billion records. Uh, and it, it was several gigabytes of download. Uh, but I, 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 cut, I cut it down to only the records that I wanted. 
Uh, and so imagine doing something like that with a selection sort. No way. No way is that going to work. Uh, I've, uh, I've got uh, a little bit more here to show you. Let me go ahead and go back to uh, not 1.7 million. Uh, let's go back to uh, the slow one. And let's only do 10,000 so we're not sitting here forever. And I'm not going to time it anymore because I want to show you something else. Once it's done, and I've got to remind myself how to do this. Uh, yeah, OK, gprof. Uh, what was it? Find dupes slow selection sort. All right, there we go. So this is a report. gprof is a profiling tool. Let me go ahead and start at the, the, the top here. All right, gprof is a, profi a profiling tool, is one of the last tools that you use uh, in the, the software development process. Uh, so you've debugged it. It works fine. Uh, you, you've, you've run uh, Valgrind, so there are no memory leaks that it can be detected. You've, uh, uh, you've taken care of all the lint by running through the, the, the linter, the, the warnings all flag, et cetera, et cetera. So your code is, uh, the code itself is perfect, but it's still running slow, and you want to know why. Where, are you, where is your programming spending most of its time? Then comes in a, uh, a, what's called perf tools. Perf is short for performance tools. Uh, and perf analysis, performance analysis. You, you can bring in profilers to generate basically reports telling you what your code, where your code is spending the most time, where, uh, how many function calls are being made to your code. Like this is the most common function over here or something like that. gprof is one such tool that's been installed on CSE. There are several profiling tools. Uh, o profile and uh, I forget the other one, but I've got it in my README file. They don't they don't look as nice though, uh, and they're not as easy. Uh, so you can see this. Uh, it, it didn't take that much uh, time at all, but it did take 50 million, a uh, little over 50 million calls to my comparator. That tell that gives me a big red flag right there. I was only trying to uh, I was only trying to uh, sort 10,000 elements, but you make over 50 million function calls to do that. Right? That is a big red flag right there that I should be looking at a more uh, efficient solution. It spent over 52.69% of its time in that function, calling that function. Uh, and it, it spent the rest of its time in the parent function selection sort. Right? Uh, and then you can have, uh, it generates basically what are, what are called call graphs. Selection sort, uh, let's see, these are uh, main calls selection sort, and it also calls load database, and it, call, and it also calls this in that for loop. So main has three children. You can look up those children. Uh, where are they? Uh, selection sort would be, oops, where is it? Here. Then this is the call graph for two. So uh, it's telling me, go to the call graph for two to see all of its children. Selection sort makes a call to the CMP transaction by ID. Uh, and that's where it spends the vast majority of its time, making over 50 million uh, function calls. Uh, but otherwise, if you, if you just look at the load database phase here, where it calls load database, look at that profile for six. It calls load database, it calls uh, the, the init transaction CSV, uh, that, that's like your initialization function. It only called that 10,000 10, times, and that makes sense because I loaded up 10,000 records. Right? So a sanity check here tells me it was spending only 5% of the time there. That's not where you should focus your efforts. Loading the database up was fast. It didn't take any, it took a cumulative time of 0 0.02 seconds. And it uh, only took 5% uh, of your time. Where you should be focusing your efforts are these big ones right here. Right? And that's where you can go in and start optimizing your code. Uh, you make, that tra uh, make, that, uh, make selection sort faster by getting rid of it. You can make your co uh, comparison function faster, maybe by getting rid of a few things or optimizing, uh, optimizing it in a way that I, do, uh, I don't need to compare all of these things, or I don't, need to, uh, I don't need to call an expensive function like string comparison. I can, call, uh, I can convert that to an integer and then uh, call it that way, or it can represent the data some other way. Right? Uh, the, a profiling tool allows you to see these things. Now, this is just a flat profile, meaning that it's all text and you have to read it. But there are plenty of other ways of representing this stuff. Uh, gprof um, uh, call graph example. You, there are other tools that you can run after profiling, and I'm just going to look up uh, images here, uh, that can actually show you graphically what's going on. This function calls these functions. This function calls this function and that function. And then you can follow these through and, and, uh, and see what function is calling what function. And then if you see, wait a second, why would that function ever be calling that function? 
that gives you a way to go and start diagnosing the problem. Or you can use what are called the heat maps. Oh, there's, there's, right, there's a heat map right there. It gives you a, a visualization of the hottest parts of your code. Uh, not that it's a popular, it, it is a popular part of your code because it's, you're making so many function calls there. Uh, and that, those are the things, you want to focus on the hottest areas of your code first. Uh, and, uh, and then the cooler areas, well, the, the, we can worry about those after optimizing uh, the hot areas here. And you can run tools like this. And it, it's part of, uh, a, a part of testing called perf analysis, per, uh, performance analysis. Uh, so after you've done your unit tests, after you've done your debugging, after you've done everything else, uh, and it's still in, uh, inefficient, uh, or uh, users are saying, well, it takes, it, it takes me five seconds for that web page to load or something like that. You can run a complex perf tool to see, well, where is the bottleneck? Where is the, uh, wh what, what are they really waiting on? Are they waiting on network because they're going through some uh, firewall stuff or something like that, and maybe we can take, uh, take care of it that way? Or is it not loading up from the database because we didn't, put, uh, the, the database is slow because we didn't index it or something like that? Uh, and you could, by, by running these tools, you can find those hot areas of your code that need to be addressed first. Okay? Uh, it goes beyond the scope of this course, but I did want to show you these tools and, and uh, not how to use them, but the, uh, you should be aware of their existence so that you can uh, think in the future that, uh, well, it's really slow. I wonder why. Maybe I can look into a perf tool uh, to check it out. All right. All right. So that was their demonstration. The rest of the semester, I don't even know if I want to embed this in the notes or not, but uh, the week ne next week is going to be GUIs for one lecture. Uh, then uh, next week plus uh, last week, dead week. I'll call it dead week. We still call them dead weeks, right? Yeah, okay. Uh, ne uh, next week and dead week is going to be databases, uh, maybe two lectures there. And then the last lecture will be a review. And it'll be like the midterm review where I bring in uh, last year's uh, final and we'll do it. Uh, and um, It'll be recorded if you want to use the solution or whatever. Uh, that's fine too. Uh, but that's the last one. But also, dead week, I will be live streaming at least Monday through Thursday. I don't know about Friday because I'll have to go. I think I have to go to... Uh, uh, UNMC that week, uh, but d definitely Monday through Friday at various times, I'll be live streaming Advent of Code. There we go. So as a review, uh, uh, you, you, you don't have to do this if you don't want to, uh, but Advent of Code is this uh, website uh, that was started in uh, here, where are, uh, let's go to, I think they started in 2014, nope, 2015, there we go. So it uh, looks back, back in 2015, I got bored with it pretty quick. Uh, but it, it's an advent calendar. Uh, it's an advent calendar that every day during December, starting December 1st, every day they release a, uh, the, uh, every day has two exercises, one main exercise and then a variation on the exercise. So if you solve the first one, it's just a little bit of a variation to solve the second one. So you can earn two stars every day all the way up until Christmas, where you earn the, the, you know, the last two stars. I jumped ahead to here to see what it looks like, and it doesn't let you go to the last star until uh, you've got all the stars. Uh, there are leaderboards. Uh, so it looks like anonymous user 209, good job, uh, won in 2015. Uh, you can look at per day, this is overall. So on Christmas, who won? So Angus Lim decided to go ahead and do Advent of Code in four minutes instead of opening his presents or something from Santa. Uh, and that's what he did that year. Uh, but what I'll be doing, it, of course, it's not, uh, it hasn't been released yet, but uh, you, you can check out the past events. On, I, I think, local time, it'll be 11 o'clock because it's going to be midnight Eastern time. Uh, don't jump on there right at 11 unless you really want to get on the leaderboard or something like that. Uh, I won't even be doing it on that, uh, that weekend. December 1st is a Saturday. No way am I going to do it on a Saturday. Uh, so I'm going to wait for that Monday, which would be the 3rd. And I will be live streaming on YouTube uh, solutions. I'll be walking through the solutions using C as a review for all four of those days. Uh, if you want to, uh, you can subscribe up to me on YouTube or just go to my YouTube channel. Uh, don't, don't subscribe to me. Uh, or if you, do, if you do, go ahead and unsubscribe from me after the end of the semester. Otherwise, you'll be getting a bunch of nonsense videos for the rest of your life. 
uh, but I'll be live streaming those uh, in the morning, uh, those four days. Uh, they'll still be recorded and available after the fact, so if you don't want to watch me in the morning, but you want to watch me whatever time, then you can go ahead and watch those. It's going to be as a review. They do tend to start out easier, and then after, as you go along in, uh, from December 1st all the way to the 25th, they do get harder. Uh, the, uh, I, 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 as a, I, I was bored, so I tried to do 2017 recently. And what is it, 2017? And uh, the first few days are pretty straightforward and easy. The last few days here have been kind of tough because it's, it's required some algorithmic knowledge. Uh, I had to, like, uh, uh, in this one, I had to use BFS to actually solve it. Uh, so they can get uh, pretty complex. Uh, but they're, uh, the, the first few days are going to be excellent practice for your final exam. Uh, it'll, it'll, it, it's it's kind of like coding kata, if you've heard that term before. Kata are kind of martial arts things like wax on, wax off, that you do these things over and over again, and you get the muscle memory to, uh, to, to do the martial arts, whatever. I don't do martial arts, but I do do coding. And the coding kata is doing exercises like this over and over again until it becomes second nature, and you just immediately are able to, okay, I know how to do it, write a, a for loop to process this, uh, this line by line file or something like that. Uh, it, it's 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 going to be excellent practice. If you want to watch the videos, great. If you don't, that's fine. Uh, you've got other things to do. I'm 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 certainly aware of that. Uh, but I'm, it's an experiment. I've never done it th like this before. Uh, I only recently installed some OBS software, uh, and it's actually really really impressive how how easy it is to use and how how high quality the the OBS software is. If anybody knows, like the OBS software is open broadcast yeah. sy system. What's the S? Systems, OK. Uh, and everybody on Twitch, I'm sure, uses something like that uh, to live stream their games. Uh, I'll put my head down in the corner. Uh, and uh, my, uh, my, my otherwise, uh, just like the, the Twitchers do, and then uh, put everything else. Uh, I, 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 did, I did a test, and the, uh, uh, the resolution is high enough that you'll be able to see my entire screen, and you, I won't have to zoom in or anything. Uh, and then I'll, I'll do it. If, 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 I, if I can't solve it, then I'll just look bad on YouTube or something for a day. All right? uh, but that's, that's going to be a good review, a uh, good way to review for the final. Yeah? I don't know. How do I look that up? I have 73. How do you tell that? Oh, where is. Okay. How do I even look this up? My, cha my channel? 73. Oh, wow. How do I look who they are? The uh, no, these aren't it. I don't even. I don't know. All right, uh, students do it. Uh, I think I got like 20 subscribers in one day because of my GDB video. That seemed to be a really popular hit. Uh, I don't know why, uh, but uh, no, there, there, there. It's scheduled. Scheduled for the uh, the, the well. There should be more here. There we go. Uh, these are my OBS tests. Uh, scheduled for the third at 10:30 a.m. On the fourth, it'll be 11:30 a.m. Uh, on the third, it'll be 12 uh, noon. On the or it's fifth uh, noon, and uh, on the sixth, it'll be 11:30 a.m. So, uh, if you want to, you can join at that time. Or oh, I, I got an email that somebody just subscribed to me. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you. No, no, this should say 73 now, right? Or 74? Oh, 75. Two of you did. Okay. <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs>